I'll be very happy to uh, take questions or challenges to the ideas. And I would invite you also, if you get a chance, to visit our web presence or uh, to visit us on social media to follow what we're up to. Professor Adams, that was really outstanding on behalf of everybody else. Let me do an initial applause. When we bring everybody else in later, I'm sure you're going to get some more kudos. Um, sure. Thank first, you. Thank you. Sure. First, let me uh, uh, read off questions that have come in during your lecture, and uh, then we'll open it up to the, to the floor after that, if that's okay. Sure. And, and the first one is from Rhonda Hageman. In your view, are Hor Aha and Menes the same individual or two separate rulers? Well, that's a, that's a difficult question to answer. Uh, in, in, later, in later Egyptian history, um, uh, in, in lists of royal names and so on, they frequently um, give the, not the Horus name that we're most familiar with from the archeological record, but rather the personal name of the king, which oftentimes uh, uh, is not attested archeologically. Um, and scholars have suggested that uh, many or manys uh, in the Greek uh, version uh, may have been the personal name either of Narmer or Aha. Uh, it's, the, it's the individual that the Egyptians uh, later saw as the first king of Egypt. He takes that position again and again in, in uh, king lists, including the king list in the temple of Seti at Abydos. Some people have argued that it should be Aha because Aha is the, was the first king to have uh, what could be characterized as a monumental tomb, that that was a, a step distinguishing him from all of the earlier uh, uh, rulers. Uh, but I think the strongest argument uh, for identifying it with Narmer uh, is a seal impression that the Germans found at Umel Gab uh, some years ago that actually it's the official seal of the Royal Necropolis from that time, Dynasty One, uh, And it gives a list of all the names of the kings with tombs there as they understood it to be. Uh, and that list begins with Narmer. So the, the ancient Egyptians of the first dynasty are saying what we're doing here in the royal necropolis begins with King Narmer. And uh, so I think that, that it's circumstantial, but I think that that's a very strong argument that uh, the figure of Menes uh, should be identified with Narmer. Okay. And there, there, there has been some, uh, uh, some suggestion from bits and pieces of seal impressions and so on that, that uh, Mena or Menni may in fact have been the personal name of uh, the Horus Narmer. Thank you. Rhonda replied, excellent. Uh, okay, thank you. Okay, I have a question from Rodney Shuf. Um, would the enclosures be Sarek shaped? He was talking about this in the first one, but he said it applied to the later ones too. Well, it's very, that's, a, that's an excellent question. One of the uh, uh, characteristic features of the Sarek is that it shows uh, at the bottom, it shows the facade of a building which has elaborate geometric niches on it. Uh, and the, the name of the king is shown as being inside this structure. Uh, some people have interpreted it as uh, the royal palace, which it may be, uh, but I would point out that these structures, the enclosures that we have, are characterized, the facade is characterized by exactly uh, that kind of uh, niching pattern. It, they all have it. Um, <clears throat> uh, and uh, uh, so whether um, the Sarek 
the, the enclosure was built to mimic a Sarek or the Sarek was intended to mimic, to depict a, a cult place like this or to depict the royal palace uh, where, the, where the king would have been the same as a, a god in his temple uh, conceptually. Um, they're all, all of those things are drawing on the same um, uh, kind of uh, architectural or design vocabulary. The niched facade is uh, represents this uh, this uh, sacred uh, liminal other quality uh, with which the king was imbued. Um, he, his identity is given as inside this thing. Um, that was what defined him. Uh, it may very well be that that this is these enclosures are what they're referring to, uh, but we at this point we can't be certain about that. But they all are drawing on the same uh, kind of uh, uh, design vocabulary. These elements that represent the ideas. Okay, thank you. Uh, I have a series of questions from uh, Cindy Lagreca for next. And uh, first one, what drew you to Abydos for your life's work? Well, uh, I think uh, it, it's not an uncommon uh, story. It had everything to do with uh, the, uh, my, who was my mentor. David I took my PhD under David O'Connor uh, at the University of Pennsylvania. And um, uh, he, uh, had been working at Abydos uh, since the 1960s. Uh, and uh, uh, I, as a graduate student, I, as an undergraduate and graduate student, I did field work with him uh, at the site. And then when the time came for me to think about PhD work, um, uh, I was very interested at that time in Egyptian urbanism um, and David, uh, we were out there in 1988, uh, working on the enclosure of Jur, and David walked me over to the, the ancient town site, um, and we were chatting, and, and he said, well, if you want to do town sites, what about this one? And so I did, and, um, uh, once I was done, uh, uh, with that work, then David asked me to uh, join him at the IFA in New York um, and really to uh, take the project uh, over for him. He was no longer able at that point because of his, uh, his teaching and other responsibilities in the States at New York to do the kind of long field stents that uh, he had done previously. And so that was when I came on in 99 uh, uh, to uh, direct things on the ground. Uh, and then with his uh, retirement a few, some years ago, uh, uh, I've taken on the, the uh, full directorship of the, of the expedition. Okay, thank you. Uh, her, Cindy's next question, how close to the Nile are these structures? Are they built of mud uh, brick? Is the mud directly from the Nile? Uh, they are built of mud brick. Uh, they're, this site is about, uh, seven or eight miles from the Nile. Now, it was a bit closer in ancient times. Uh, the course of the Nile has shifted over, over time uh, toward the east. Um, but the, uh, the ancient town or city of Abydos is right on the edge of the Nile floodplain. The agricultural land that before the high dam was built was inundated annually. Um, and uh, the, uh, the rich Nile mud from that annual inundation from the alluvial plain was what they used to build, to make the bricks. And in fact, we've, we uh, uh, are involved in the uh, uh, architectural conservation program at the Cossack Emwe Monument to uh, ensure its survival, uh, hopefully for another 5,000 years. And the bricks that we use in that work are made from exactly the same source, the local mud uh, from the alluvial plain just down below uh, the site. Okay, thank you. Uh, Cindy's next question, 
how deep were the structures buried that you showed buried? Are also, you indicated early structures, tombs, slash tombs were designed with no superstructure. However, uh, Cassock M way seems to be above ground. Okay, the, 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 the royal tombs are physically separate from these royal cultic enclosures about one and a half kilometers. The tombs are out in the far distance in this uh, photograph that I think may still be on your screen at the far distance uh, at the base of those cliffs. That's the location of the royal tombs. Each one of those tombs was a subterranean uh, structure that had a small tumulus on the top. Uh, it may have been enclosed in brick. Uh, uh, the one of Hasek, and we may have been enclosed with the skin of stone, but they were very modest and visibility from uh, the ancient town would have been next to nil. Um, however, these big monumental constructions uh, immediately next to the ancient town, overlooking the ancient town, um, uh, they're on this desert terrace uh, and they have no substructure. The, these are structures that were built directly on the natural desert uh, surface. So I'm sorry if I, if I wasn't completely clear about that, but the royal tombs and these cult places are separated by about uh, one and a half kilometers. Okay, thank you. Um, next question, we have a series of questions from Laura Engel. Uh, how long are, are excavation seasons usually and what time of the year? Well, first of all, winter. Uh, in the in the summer, when it's 125 degrees, no thank you. Uh, <laughs> I did that. I did that a few times as a as a student, uh, uh, but I there is just no there is just no way I can do that at this at this point. And it, and also, I wouldn't ask that of my teams uh, because the work you're not able to think straight. Uh, frequently in those kind of conditions, and the work would suffer. Uh, I want people at their best, and in January and February, daytime highs are in the 70s, lows usually in the 40s. Uh, it's terrific uh, working weather. There are no mosquitoes, um, and there's a reason that the Winter Palace Hotel in Luxor was called the Winter Palace, <laughs> with all the rich Europeans coming to winter there. That makes sense, thank you. And the, our field seasons, years ago, uh, in the early 2000s, we would be there four or five months, but now usually two months is the longest that we're on site working. Two months, okay. Um, her next question, how long did AHA rain? Oh, well, that, that's a good question. Uh, uh, for some of these kings, uh, we can get an idea uh, of rain length from fragments of preserved annals that were carved on, you may have heard of the Palermo stone and pieces of it that are in various museums around the world. These were royal annals of the first five, I think, dynasties, uh, 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 beginning with the, king, first, uh, the kings of the first dynasty. And it's year by year. Uh, what they perceived as the singular event for each year uh, was recorded. Um, uh, I don't remember off the top of my head uh, whether the Palermo stone gives a total uh, for King Aha. Uh, it, I think it does for Hasek Emwi, and it's up in the 20s. Uh, so he had a nice long reign more than enough time to build this gigantic enclosure and his gigantic, equally gigantic uh, uh, tomb out at Umo Gab. <clears throat> uh, but for a lot of them, it's, uh, we don't really know for sure. The, 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 the annals uh, stone is so broken up, it's so fragmentary that we, <clears throat> you know, you get one or two years of somebody's reign and you don't have the beginning or the end. And then the next fragment is, is a completely different king and it's the middle of his reign and... Okay, thank you. Difficult to be sure. 
Laura's next question. Are they planning on doing an analysis of the beer jars for contents and the recipes? Well, that's us. We're the ones that are going to be doing that analysis. And, <laughs> and the idea is a resounding yes. Uh, right. uh, we w I want to know, we have this residue, the organic residue, you know, of the mash, the actual beer mash that was cooked in these vats. It's still there in a lot of them. Uh, we have that residue. Um, we also have organic residue inside the beer jars from these offering deposits. Um, and we also have a lot of uh, charcoal from the wood fuel that was used for in the firing, the cooking of the, the beer mash. The, the, these uh, brewery structures, there's a lot of wood charcoal still there uh, from the last firing episode. Um, you know, these things are 30, 40 meters long uh, and they had stoke holes every meter where they were putting the wood fuel in. That's a lot of wood um, and there's a lot of it still there. So we hope to uh, uh, analyze that as well, get C14 dates to help uh, pin down hopefully uh, exactly where the structure falls, its range of, of uh, its date range for use, um, and the formula of the beer. I would love to partner with, um, uh, you know, a beer, a modern beer company to see if we can replicate okay. what they did. Um, we'll be in touch. There's actually a company up in Boulder with uh, Dr. Travis Rupp helping them and they're developing uh, uh, ancient beers. We'll connect you. Thank you, I'd love that. Okay, um, and I think he's done an Egyptian beer, in fact, in the past. Okay. People uh, have, people have, but this is Narmer's beer. <laughs> Perfect. Okay. Uh, Laura's last question, what types of people were sacrificed and are there indications of the cause of death? Also an excellent question. Uh, well, as I mentioned, all of the uh, 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 people whose skeletons have been analyzed in modern times um, all exhibit very good health. Uh, they had excellent nutrition. Um, and so they are, and in ancient Egypt, uh, the people who had access to that kind of, those kinds of resources uh, were the highest elite level. The court, in the royal court, near the king, in the royal palace, royal officials, uh, this kind of stratum uh, uh, of society. Um, and I mean, there is some variability from individual monument to individual monument. Some of them, uh, it's all young men. Some have a mix of men and women. Uh, the one enclosure of AHA had three women, one male, and then the small child, gender uh, unknown. Um, uh, but nevertheless, they're all quite high status uh, uh, people um, and people who are in some fashion or other, close to the king. Uh, and that, that social relationship is represented materially, spatially, in their closeness to the king on the ground. Their tombs being either directly adjacent to the king's own tomb or directly adjacent to uh, uh, his sacred ritual cult uh, place where his, uh, uh, his kingly power was exhibited and, and uh, exercised. Um, <clears throat> uh, in some cases we have um, small steely uh, that survive that give their the names of the individual uh, and a few titles that uh, uh, represent uh, people in the royal household. Um, uh, now, so we have some idea of what kinds of people they were. 
um, where they stood in the pecking order. Uh, but this other question of uh, cause of death is a difficult one. None of them exhibit trauma. So they were not whacked in the head with the stone mace. Uh, uh, there's no damage to the bones of the neck to suggest that their throats were slit, uh, their necks are not broken, um, uh, nothing like this. Wow. Um, they, uh, one physical anthropologist examining uh, skulls that Petrie brought back to London thought she could see evidence of a phenomenon called pink teeth, where in the process of strangulation, the pressure of that blood is driven into the dentin uh, of, the, uh, of the teeth, turning them a, a shade of red. Um, uh, that's never been verified, uh, uh, confirmed really. Um, and that was not exhibited on the new uh, skeletons that we excavated uh, from the monuments of King Aha. Uh, nor did the Germans uh, see that on the skele new skeletons that they found uh, at uh, Umel Gab. Um, <clears throat> so with no, no or very little uh, evidence for uh, injury, uh, what could be the cause of death? Petrie thought that he saw evidence that some of the people had shifted, moved after burial. Uh, uh, I think he was wrong on that uh, score because the bodies had been uh, wrapped in cloth, uh, in, you know, quite carefully and coated with, the bodies were coated with uh, uh, oils. Um, and that's a process that's unlikely to have been conducted when the people were still uh, living. Um, uh, so the most likely uh, suspect, as it were, is uh, poison uh, of some kind, which frequently would leave no trace in the skeletal uh, uh, remains. However, the, even though it's circumstantial, all of the archaeological evidence that we've seen in the graves at the enclosures and the graves at the royal tombs, all of it is very consistent with the people being buried in these mass events, um, mass simultaneous uh, burials, uh, which are very, very strongly suggest uh, that they were sacrificed. And also, you know, if you, if you consider this moment in Egyptian uh, history, um, when, uh, all of these ideas were really being worked out. Sorry, my dogs just came in from a walk here. <laughs> Can you take those guys up? Um, uh, the, uh, if, you're, if your entire uh, raison d'etre, if your whole identity is tied up with your, your connection, your association, your relationship to the king, who was this divine, central, singular figure in ancient Egyptian society and culture. If that, if everything you were was defined by your connection to him, it's not unthinkable that you would want that to continue, not just to be in this world, but to continue forever. The Egyptians were quite certain. It was, there was no real room for doubt uh, to them that the transition uh, that the king was making from this world to the next was really being made. He was going from here to there. And it was just like crossing a threshold. And in, in that kind of conceptual context, uh, I don't really know that it's much of a stretch to say, well, my relationship to him is everything. If he's going, I'm going also. 
Interesting. I, from the movies, I always assume they were killing off slaves or captives or prisoners, not his no, own No, it's not household. like that at all. Yeah, his own household. Wow. Okay, thank you. Um, sure. Next question is from Jeffrey Newman. We know that the Djoser complex at Saqqara had connections with the celebration of the said festival. Given the connections to the Abydos enclosures, do you think it is possible that they too were connected with the earlier celebrations of the said festival? Absolutely. Okay. I mean, the said festival was the, was the central ritual of kingship, particularly in this early period. Um, and we know from uh, depictions uh, that, uh, and from the evidence from Saqqara, uh, that it took place in the, in the open air um, in a spatially delimited uh, kind of arena-like uh, context. Uh, and with the case of Djoser, uh, the, said, the said festival is uh, directly connected in a material way uh, with his great royal funerary complex. Well, for his predecessors in, in uh, uh, Dynasty 2 and 1, what do we have? We have the, the Abydos structures. Uh, these are the, uh, the, the singular royal monuments from this period. Uh, for, for these earlier kings, their tomb and their cultic enclosure at Abydos was their version of the step pyramid. It, 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 it's what kings did. Um, and they fit the pattern. Uh, this walled uh, ritual precinct, we have loads of evidence for ritual uh, being performed inside. Uh, uh, and uh, 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 given those associations, I think, although not proven, uh, yet, anyway, I would hope to be able to be more uh, certain about it. Uh, I think the, uh, it, it's very likely that um, there was a, a connection, that these were used uh, in connection with the said festival uh, in some fashion. Okay, thank you. Uh, here's Laura again. What would the landscape have looked like at the time? Um, rather like you see it in this photograph. Uh, except missing the modern uh, constructions and uh, modern, uh, the trees and things that you see in the desert in the distance, there's been a lot of uh, 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 reclamation of desert areas for agricultural uh, production in the last 20 uh, years or so. Um, so they're, they're dr drilling deep wells, they've got uh, tomato fields, onion fields, wheat fields out there. Not all that close to the Royal uh, Cemetery, but uh, along those cliffs that you see uh, in the distance uh, north of the Royal Cemetery. Um, <clears throat> and uh, of course, this all would have been absolutely pristine uh, desert uh, at that time. Uh, the kind of undulating uh, surface that you see in the foreground today that's all the result of uh, excavation in the 19th and early 20th uh, century, digging out the tombs that fill the, the landscape here. Um, uh, so the, 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 the desert surface would have been much more uh, even, uh, but the overall character would have been very much like you see in this photo. Okay. The, the, the huge, uh, boundary in the distance, uh, the, the cliffs that define the edge of the world of, of human beings uh, and the mysterious, endless uh, Sahara beyond that, um, uh, that the impression that you take uh, today, uh, it would have been the same okay. back then. Thanks. Turning the other way, however, Mm -hmm. If the photographer turned around and took the opposite direction, uh, you're looking at, you know, a, a village of 50,000 people. Okay, thank you. 
Uh, next question from Jim Loudermilk. Are the walls of the monuments aligned to any specific geographic or astronomic elements? Uh, not astronomical. Geographic, yes. Uh, uh, they're all in alignment with the course of the river in, in this region. Uh, so they're, they're, the long axis is river north-south. And the short axis and the, the main facade faces river east. Uh, in, 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 uh, uh, in the real world uh, uh, directions, uh, it faces uh, northeast. But uh, uh, in, for the uh, conceptual uh, directions for the ancient Egyptians, always following the river, uh, the main facade is facing river east, which for them symbolically is true east. Okay, thanks. Um, okay, Jan Stremi has a question. Do I see the timeline of each reign being number one, destroy the previous king's monuments, then number two, build current king's monument, where massive sacrifices were made during the current king's reign, then three, sacrificial burial at king's death, and repeat process, question mark. Uh, basically, yes. Okay. That's, that's right. Um, uh, we don't know yet uh, whether the... Uh, whether the pattern that we saw with AHA of the sacrificial burials being made at the time of construction, if that carries through with all of the other uh, enclosures, that the graves are farther away uh, from the walls, it's more difficult to assess that uh, with these other monuments. Uh, uh, and we don't know for certain that the burials at the tombs were uh, made at the time of the royal burial. That seems very likely uh, for various reasons, uh, but we're not certain about that. But this cycle of demolish and bury the uh, cultic structure of your predecessor, build your own, imbue it with sacredness, perhaps by the sacrificial burials uh, around it, ritual performance during your reign. Meanwhile, you're building your tomb out there among those of your royal forebears. Um, and then the final chapter is the royal funeral and burial, at which point uh, the whole complex tomb and uh, cult place uh, cease to function and are knocked down and buried. Uh, I didn't get into it here, but there's uh, uh, a lot of archaeological evidence that the demolition was done in a very controlled and even ritual manner. That 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 the the demolition they weren't just knocking the things down to get rid of them, but rather they were taking them down very carefully and uh, preparing the ground in them and around them. Uh, purifying it and so that the that the cult place itself these enclosures was undergoing a kind of ritual burial and it may be that the uh, that the function that it performed on behalf of the king was was essential somehow and through burial it was to be translated to the next world to be available to him there along with the people who were buried around it okay Thank you. Um, question from David Lovery, our president. Has anyone prepared a comprehensive magnetic survey of the sites surrounding Abydos? How about ground penetrating or side looking radar? Uh, we, have, uh, uh, we have done very extensive uh, magnetic survey of our uh, concession area, the area of North Abydos that the Egyptian authorities have uh, granted to us for, for uh, field work. Um, and uh, the discovery of these new royal monuments is just a very small piece of, of uh, what's come out uh, through that. Magnetometry uh, has really been a terrific uh, tool uh, for us. We worked with uh, Tomasz uh, Herbeck, 
of the Polish uh, Institute uh, in Cairo uh, and, and his team. Uh, and the, the magnetic map that they uh, put together for us, really it's like an X-ray of what's under the ground. You can see individual tombs, individual chapels. You can distinguish Middle Kingdom shaft tombs from late period vaulted tombs uh, and New Kingdom vaulted tombs. Uh, it's, it's, it's amazing. And uh, the, the downside to magnetometry is in this context, it only penetrates about a meter uh, below the present surface. And uh, for anything deeper, we have to do, go with uh, GPR, uh, ground penetrating radar. And we, we very much want to do this, but the Egyptian authorities, uh, we proposed it for our last season and, and uh, we were turned down. Uh, for that. Right now, last few years, there's a lot of concern about remote sensing of all types from the security uh, authorities in, in Egypt. And it's very difficult right now to get permission to do things that 10 or 15 years ago, no problem at all. And I'm sure that eventually uh, they'll relax uh, about that and we'll be able to resume that kind of work. There's a lot of GPR that we would like to do. Huh. Okay, thank you. Uh, another question from Cindy LaGreca. Where did they get the wood for the fires used at the brewing? Well, that's a very good question. Um, well, first of all, Egypt today is very, very wood poor. Uh, and most of the trees that you see, apart from date palms, uh, are uh, non-native species that were brought in in the colonial period. Loads of eucalyptus. Um, does very well in this environment, but it has no relationship to uh, how things would have looked in ancient times. However, uh, you know, today the population of Egypt is about 100 million. Uh, in ancient times, uh, it was, maybe it was a million or two million. And uh, settlements were quite widely, large settlements were quite widely uh, spaced, and there were big areas that were essentially still wild, uh, open space, uh, much more heavily treed uh, than we might think. And so at this early time, wood was not a particularly scarce uh, resource. They had acacia, they had uh, tamarisk, uh, quite common uh, species. Um, we haven't yet ID'd the, the uh, species of wood from the charcoal samples that we uh, have collected, but that's on our agenda also. Okay, thank you. Um, the boat burials, has anyone identified the uh, genetic makeup of the boat's wood? That's from David Lovering again. Uh, the, um, uh, uh, we do know that it is not imported cedar wood. Uh, it's, it's a local wood. It's, it's, we're 90% certain uh, that it's tamarisk. Um, uh, unfortunately, the, the state of preservation is, uh, is really quite poor. Um, and uh, a lot of it has been heavily insect eaten. Um, uh, so given its condition, the identification is uh, difficult. And also, uh, uh, at the time we excavated the, the boats, it was next to impossible to get samples out of Cairo uh, for that kind of analysis. And there were no labs at that time in Egypt capable of doing the work uh, with a, you know, on a solid, reliable basis. Uh, that's changed now. We still have uh, some samples that we collected at the time uh, in our storerooms. And also there are, uh, are now very good labs uh, in Cairo uh, that can do all kinds of chemical analyses. C14 dating can be done locally. Uh, and the Egyptian authorities are, are very supportive of, of having all kinds of uh, analysis done as long as it's in Egypt. So uh, I can't answer 
with 100% certainty. I think it's very likely uh, Tamarisk, uh, but that also is part of our near future program. Okay. Getting those samples finally analyzed. A question from David Pepper. How would you compare the early dynasty buildings and tombs at Hierakonopolis and Saqqara to Abydos? Uh, well, the, uh, at uh, Hierakonopolis uh, to the south, as I mentioned, this Hierakonopolis was a real powerhouse uh, in the uh, pre-dynastic uh, period for a very long time in the pre-dynastic. Um, and uh, a very powerful regional uh, entity. Um, uh, Renee and her team in recent years have made astonishing discoveries uh, of the, uh, the tombs of uh, these early uh, uh, rulers of, in the pre-dynastic. Um, you know, they're bearing elephants to accompany them and so on. It's incredible. Um, however, uh, uh, Hierakopolis was just one of a whole number of regional powers uh, at that time. Um, and uh, so the, the tombs that we have there, uh, as, uh, as amazing as they are, uh, and they definitely are part of the evolution of the ideology of rulership, uh, but they're not royal tombs of the kings of Egypt at all. Um, they're much earlier and, um, uh, and the Egyptians themselves recognized that, uh, they recognized Um el Gab as the location of their first kings as they perceived them. Um, <clears throat> And, uh, uh, and at Saqqara, um, uh, well, it's a good, it's an interesting point as to why these kings would have continued to build their tombs at Abydos when the capital, the ruling place is in Memphis in the north from the beginning of Dynasty One. The court cemeteries are there at Saqqara and at Helwan. Uh, the, the uh, highest royal officials uh, of the administration uh, are, are buried in uh, elaborate mastaba tombs at Saqqara that uh, Brian Emery dug uh, many years ago now. Um, <clears throat> uh, and it makes a lot of sense that, uh, uh, well, why wouldn't the king, as they did later, why wouldn't the kings build their tombs, you know, nearby, near where they were actually ruling. Uh, why would they come back to this uh, provincial location very, very far from, from Memphis uh, to build their tombs and to be buried? Um, <clears throat> uh, I think the answer is uh, the kings of the first dynasty, at least, uh, they were the descendants of the local rulers of the Abydos region. The tombs of their ancestors are, are present at Abydos, at Um el Gab, back for a thousand years through the pre-dynastic, back to the beginning of the fourth millennium uh, BCE. And it is a continuous line of development from that time right into the first dynasty. No, no, they, don't, they didn't miss a beat. There's no break there. Um, and so I think that these early kings, they're coming back to Abydos because it's their ancestral home. And, uh, and the, the, the place where a king made the transition from this world to the next is the place where his ancestors had already been doing that for a thousand years before he lived. Um, imagine at already at the time of Narmer, beginning of Dynasty One, this place was ancient. You know, a thousand years worth of their ancestors were already buried there and had given it a kind of uh, weight of sanctity, weight, weight of, uh, uh, of uh, conceptual power. Uh, 
and I think that 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 drew them back here uh, to continue uh, royal tomb building amongst their ancestors and to make their way to the afterlife up that canyon uh, after burial uh, for many generations. And um, there, Memphis had a pull, certainly. The kings at the beginning of Dynasty II did in fact make, build their tombs at Saqqara for several reigns. But then at the end of Dynasty II, they're pulled back again to, uh, to Abydos. But then finally, uh, that draw is broken uh, with the reign of Djoser, Khasakemwi's successor, who establish, establishes permanently the royal necropolis in, in Saqqara. And it's always, uh, uh, until much, much later, it's, it's always in the Memphite area from that point on. Okay, that kind of leads into the next question from Jim Corn, Jim and Carla. Are the rulers related to each other, sons following fathers? Uh, insofar as we have evidence, yes. Okay. Uh, we know, for example, that um, uh, that um, uh, Merenit, the mother of Den, was the queen of King Jet, who was the ruler between Jur and uh, uh, and uh, Marinid and Den at the time, he also has a as yet unexcavated enclosure at uh, at Abydos. Um, so, I mean, that's a very certain example of father to uh, son uh, transmission of kingship. Um, we also know. Uh, from the monument of Khasakemwi uh, and from the tomb of Khasakemwi that uh, Djoser was responsible for the burial of uh, Khasakemwi. Uh, there's no king in between. It's clear from seal impressions and other evidence that Djoser supervised the burial and Djoser supervised the final stages of the use of Khasakemwi's enclosure. We found some seal impressions of him uh, there as well. Uh, uh, and there's some other evidence that suggests that Djoser may very well have been uh, Hasek uh son. Uh, so it, it, it does seem very likely that, that it's this uh, paternal transmission from father to son uh, okay. through the, the first dynasty and second. Right. That is the most submitted questions uh, we've ever had in the times we've been on Zoom. But I do have well, one I, more from Jeff yeah. Stevenson. When is the Book of Abydos coming out? Well, you know what? I, uh, David O'Connor did a very good book. It uh, came out a few years ago. Maybe some of you have seen it or, or have read it. Um, it's a very thorough uh, uh, overview. Um, uh, but I... I have uh, a, a rather different kind of book uh, in mind uh, for what I'm going to do that, that's a bit closer to the ground uh, in, in terms of the, the, uh, the work that I've been involved in, in the last uh, 20 years or so. Uh, I can't give you an exact time frame uh, uh, for when it'll see, uh, when it'll hit the bookstore shelves, if there are still bookstore shelves at that point. Uh, <laughs> If there are still paper books, I hope so. Um, but uh, uh, my, uh, not only am I working on it, my wife is pushing me to get to it uh, also. And uh, that's a strong uh, motivator. <laughs> okay, thank you.